Atheist Nomads, episode 112, news for September 17, 2015. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo haws. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to the episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode 112. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Magnets. How do they work? Uh, it's called electromagnetism. <laughs> it's a, a very well-known force and uh, it's called science. I don't believe it. My <laughs> face is painted. <laughs> okay, it's not, but still. Ah, ICP. Ugh. Yeah. So, so anyways. How have you been? Um. Ah, man. Uh, putt-putting all around. Loving this little scooter. It's so badass. I give nice. zero fucks. It's so much fun. Oh, uh, <laughs> fantasy football. Uh, just started. I'm on the uh, team zero fucks. Yeah. Uh, the uh, team is the fantasy football league of sinister secularists. A whole bunch of uh, atheists and scooters. Skeptic podcasters are a part of this, and it's cool. Well, I lost my first match, but we'll see. I'm sure I won't finish finish dead last. I'll, I'll definitely do better than last. All right. Well, while you've been <laughs> geeking it out, and yeah. uh, the geek jock hybrid like that, uh, yeah. I will, Laura and I went out to the her family's cabin in uh, Island Park, and then Saturday we went to Yellowstone. And really? it was an interesting trip because we didn't go to a single geyser. <laughs> okay. Which, well, Yellowstone is really fucking massive. Which that made it feel like there weren't a lot of people there. Oh, yeah. I what can we, see that. Yeah. So what we did do is we went out to the, uh, did the kind of the North Loop and went out to the Lamar Valley. And while we were there, we saw a whole bunch of antelope, hmm. a lot of bison, okay. a grizzly bear. Okay. Now, the grizzly bear was way up, halfway up a hill that was on the other side of the meadow in the, the valley, um, but there was people there with spotting scopes that made it easier to see, and that was, that was pretty cool, seeing a grizzly out in the wild. And uh, then on the way back out, we got stuck in an elk jam that took about 45 minutes to get through, and we finally got there, and we pulled over so we could go take a look, because it was seven elk literally right on the side of the road nice uh, was where the roads right on the edge of the madison river they were on the bank and a couple of them out in the river including two babies uh one or two yearlings and the rest were more mature mature females and then right after that we saw a five-point bull really in the trees mm -hmm. and he was hidden in the trees just enough that most people didn't see that so we pulled over got over there um, actually, I had to loop back around to, to get to it, and uh, there was a couple other people that had stopped, and of course, once people stop, everybody else stops, sure. and we got out in the meadow, because by that time, the, the the elk had gotten further back in the trees, and then some jackass yelling at his buddy starts stomping through the trees, breaking <laughs> branches, making a ton of noise, scared the shit out of that bull elk. And so he pops out of the trees about 50 feet from us. Hmm. You're supposed to stay at least 100 feet away from any wildlife. Did the jackass stuff. know that he was over there? I, I'm guessing he figured that out. Ah, he should be glad the fucker, that the fucking bull didn't charge him. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they tend to be skittish. Maybe, but, I but mean, if he was all around his females, he'd be like kind of protective, I would think. He was a quarter mile away from them. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I think it was a little early for elk uh, mating season. I think that's not for a couple more weeks. 
uh, bison were definitely starting on it. Uh, we did find um, one little, uh, not quite a herd, but a, I guess a family. Um, two males, four females, and a handful of babies. No, oh, two babies. And one of the males was just rolling around in the dirt. <laughs> that was awesome. Legs up, just all wiggling. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it was it was really cool. Uh, the only things we were missing were moose and bighorn sheep. <laughs> yeah, so that was that was pretty freaking cool. And then uh, this weekend we've got uh, Hyde Park Street Fair, and both Humanists of Idaho and Idaho Atheists have booths there, and I'll be working at both. And then I'll be uh, recording another podcast. Oh, sweet! Which one? Latter Day Atheists. Huh. That's uh, run by two guys here locally. Cool. Yeah. So that'll be uh, that'll be a, that'll be fun. And then uh, in two weeks from uh, release date on this, October 1st, uh, I'll be walking in Light the Night. And I did put a link, link in the show notes to where you can go and and uh, pledge some money towards me. Oh, sweet. Yeah, you're raising money for? The uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Okay. And uh, we got a Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason team. Uh, Foundation Bound Belief was sponsoring teams uh, a few years back. And the Stiefel Free Thought Foundation for the first two years uh, mm-hmm. was was matching the donations, and that has since ended. Uh, but a lot of the the coalition teams are continuing uh, to do it. Uh, two years ago, I was the team captain, and uh, since becoming the uh, the head of the coalition, I have uh, delegated that duty to to somebody else who actually is herself a cancer survivor, um, thyroid cancer, not leukemia or lymphoma, but lymphoma is one that definitely has a special place in my heart. My mom is a survivor of it. And if it hadn't been for the treatment that she got at the Mountain State Tumor Institute here in Boise, um, she wouldn't have survived and wouldn't have been able to have me after that. Damn. All right, let's go ahead and uh, move on to our our special topic uh, this evening. William Miller and 1844. As promised, we are going to start digging into the history of the Adventist Church. William Miller rejected his Baptist background as a young man and became a deist. He then served as an officer in the U.S. Army in the War of 1812 and viewed his survival in the American victory in the Battle of Plattsburgh as miraculous. And miracles, as you may or may not know, doesn't fit well with deism, which has a very distant and non-involved God. After the war, he started farming, and between his war experience and the deaths of his father and sister, he became obsessed with questions about death and an afterlife. He eventually started attending his family's Baptist church again, and even though he still claimed to be a deist, he began reading the sermons in the normal preacher's absence. Um, One of the reasons for that was the most of the people they had did a a poor job of reading those sermons, and he knew he could do better. He'd rather do it himself, even if he didn't believe it, than have somebody who, well, have to sit through somebody stumbling through it. And one of those sermons on the topic of parental duties convinced him of a savior and it converted him. And then after being challenged by a fellow deist of his new, over his newfound faith, he started studying the Bible, going through each verse until he became clear of its meaning and then moving on to the next. He first became convinced that postmillennialism is unbiblical. And that is that Christ would return after the millennium or that the time in heaven would be after the millennium. And then he uh, became convinced that the timing of that return was revealed in prophecy, namely Daniel 8.14, which reads, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he believed the sanctuary was the earth, and the cleansing was Christ's return, and he applied the day-to-a-year principle to calculate the time. And the day-to-a-year principle is something that has a bit of of biblical... uh, support there's several verses where uh prophetic words are said to be a day for a year and so he went ahead and applied that to it he chose 457 bc as the year that artaxerxes the first of persia issued the decree to rebuild jerusalem as the starting point thus the second coming would be 1843 how convenient Uh uh-huh And he had this all figured out in 1818, which actually means that his conversion was very, very quick after the war. 
because he didn't get out of the army until 1815. So that was a rather quick process. Uh, but he continued to study this privately until 1823 to make sure that he was actually right. He then formally released a document with these conclusions in September 1822. Then in 1831, he started doing public lectures to tell people that Jesus was coming in 12 years. And this is mostly in the upstate New York and New England region. What do they call that area? The burned out area? The scorched area? <laughs> because of all the, the religious people that came out of that, that, that district? Um, yeah, that was the, the home of the Second Great Awakening. And this is actually all taking place at the tail end of the Second Great Awakening. And the timing of William Millard and his preaching fits pretty closely with the start of Joseph Smith and his preaching, and not very far apart. Hmm. So then in 1840, the Millerite campaign uh, became a nationwide movement, and they started publishing a monthly paper, The Signs of the Times. And this is a publication that continues to this day, run by the Adventist Church. Miller resisted predicting an exact date, but was sure it'd be between March 21, 1843, and March 21, 1844, matching up with a year on the Jewish calendar. After hmm. March 21, 1844 passed, they picked a new date using a different calendar, April 18, 1844. <laughs> but still no return of Jesus. Aww. Disappointed, Miller issued a statement. I confess my error and acknowledge my disappointment, yet I still believe that the day of the Lord is near, even at the door. Then at a camp meeting in New Hampshire in August 1844, Samuel S. Snow, one of the leaders in the Millerite movement, delivered his true midnight cry sermon, now famous within Adventist circles, in which he picked the date of October 22, 1844. These Adventists, with numbers somewhere in the 50,000 to 500,000 range, That's were so convinced that they'd be going to heaven on October 22 of that year, they quit their jobs stopped going to school, didn't bother harvesting their crops, and on October 22, 1844, they waited, didn't, looking to the east for Christ to return. Didn't they wait on a mountaintop, a hilltop? Some did. Others were on their porches. Hmm. We're, we're talking tens or hundreds of thousands of people. That's a hell of a range, though. Yeah. That's a hell of yeah. a lot of people, no matter what. Yeah, they didn't have good records on, on numbers. And then once the sun went down, the tears started. This was the great disappointment. 50 to 500,000 people, destitute, distraught, they put their all on it, and nothing. Most of them left the movement and tried to return to their former churches, but some held on. Two of the successor groups are still around today. The Advent Christian Church, with 61,000 members, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, with 18 million members. And of course, William Miller, his heart broken by this disappointment, died on October 20, 1849, convinced that Christ would return any day. And like countless others who believe that Christ would return in his lifetime, he died disappointed. Do you know any of the, the major differences between the two branches? They split over Sunday. Oh, it's a Sunday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday thing? Yeah. Uh, which that split actually happened 1850s. Okay, so a couple of years after he died. Yeah, it wasn't too terribly long. And, you know, by the time Miller died, he was not a major leader in the movement. Yeah. Uh, between 1844 and 1849, uh, they pretty much all rejected the concept of hell and immortal souls. Uh huh. Um, immaterial souls. And then. Yeah, as 1850s, uh, the group that, the, the smaller group started worshiping on Saturday. The bigger group kept worshiping on Sunday. Hmm. The bigger group went through multiple fractures and disintegrated with the exception of the Advent Christian Church, whereas the smaller group uh, has done quite well for itself. And we will get into the early Adventist period uh Next time. So, what do you have for us for history? So, this day in history, September 17th, starting with 1884. Uh, 
California judge sets a record for trying criminal cases. So, (laughs) yeah, I'm not saying this is a good thing. And I don't even know (laughs) if the record really stands anymore. But, yeah. So, uh, Judge Ellen disposes of 13 criminal cases in his Oakland, California docket in only six minutes. Although he apparently set a new record for speed... Uh, defendants in Oakland's criminal court did not stand in much of a chance of gaining an acquittal. <laughs> uh, yeah, in a 40 year period at the turn of that century, only one defendant in about a hundred was acquitted. Wow. So, yeah, that's kind of like the hanging judge of sorts. Well, now to be fair today, it's about five and a hundred that don't do a plea bargain. <laughs> hmm. That actually get a trial. Yeah, a lot of them don't ever make it to, to trial. That's true. Huh. Man. So, yeah, we have. I also have a, a small transcript of a 1895 trial that was printed in the Oakland Tribune. And so, uh, me and Dustin are going to act this out. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> and I am the despicable Judge Allen. I will play Gus Harland. And you're doing the officer as well. I am. I didn't think I was drunk, your honor. Not drunk? Not very drunk. How drunk? Well, I could see the moon. It was raining hard Sunday night when I arrested that man. Six dollars for or three days. Next. <laughs> and that's the fucking trial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, so <laughs> that that's that's well, at least it's fucking expedited. Shit. Anyways, uh, moving on along. This day in history, 1916, Manfred von Richthofen shoots down his first plane. <laughs> and the reason you've probably never heard of that guy is because you definitely have heard of his alter ego, the Red Baron, a striking uh, propaganda tool back from world war one man yeah so he was a german fighter pilot with uh, the imperial german air service uh the luftstreitkräfte fucking nailed that during world war one and he was definitely considered um the ace of aces during the war officially credited with uh 80 air combat victories so yeah wow first victory on this day man yeah they pumped that shit up the germans <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so okay, military aviation was really just starting then uh, there had been the use of balloons before balloons and airplanes for minor surveillance but that's about it and world war one early in the war it was all surveillance mm-hmm. uh, you'd have people flying in planes watching often unarmed, or maybe with just a service pistol. Then they're like, wait a minute, why don't you carry bombs in there and drop them on the enemy while you're up there? (laughs) Which then, wait a minute, the enemy is dropping bombs on us from the air. We must shoot them down. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Interesting tidbit. Uh, He was shot down and killed uh, 21st April 1918. Uh, and there's definitely been a lot of debate regarding many aspects of his career, especially the circumstances of his death. But, uh, yeah, I'm sure he was a hell of a propaganda tool that they use, that the Germans used to their advantage for a long time. Oh, oh. We, we have to give credit where credit was due. Hmm. He was killed chasing a Canadian, Wait. a novice Canadian pilot. Ooh, a Canuck. Uh-huh. Lieutenant Wilfred Wap May. Man, oh man. And then a friend of May's, uh, Captain Arthur Roy Brown, was the one who actually shot down the Red Baron. Huh. So. Man. Go Canada. Yeah. Canadian bacon and maple syrup. Hooray. (laughs) Oh, and Canada arm. Yay. Yes. And killing the Red Baron. Fucking A. (laughs) Oh, man. All right, so moving on along. This day in history, 1976, this first space shuttle Enterprise is unveiled by NASA. Yay! Yay! 
Whoosh. Yeah. So, yeah, a little bit of history on this. Uh, construction began on what's later known as Enterprise uh, back in the middle of 1974. At the time, it was designated OV-101, and it was originally planned to be called the Constitution and uh, unveiled on Constitution Day, September 17th, 76. But uh, there was, interestingly, a letter writing campaign by a whole bunch of Trekkies to uh, President Gerald Ford at the time. You know, kind of like how we have the White House petitions now. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so (laughs) uh, Gerald Ford asked that the orbiter be named after the Starship Enterprise. Uh, but he never really said that it was because of the letter writing campaign, but we all know it was because of the Trekkies. Anyways, uh, now what's hilarious with that. Yeah. Named after a fictional ship. No. Yep. That was named after a very long, long line of many naval vessels. Yeah. Very amazing vessels in general. Including a nuclear vessel. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> all right good one all right uh so unfortunately enterprise actually never made it to space uh yeah it was used for a whole bunch of tests and even glide tests you know taking it into the air letting it drop and see what happened but uh never actually left our our atmosphere yeah yeah it's uh but uh yeah on uh, september 17th uh, it was rolled out at Rockwell's plant in Palmdale, California, and in recognition of, of its fictional namesake, uh, Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry and most of the cast from the original series of Star Trek were on hand for the dedication. Very nice. Yeah. There's some great pictures. You need to see the leisure suits. Go look for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So this day in history. 1996 oprah launches her book club yeah so say what you want to i'll say a bunch (laughs) with oprah's official book club there were a few amazing books like middlesex by jeffrey eugenids uh anna karenina by tolstoy uh but there were some questionable works like james Frey's a million little pieces that was listed as a memoir but it was ultimately torn down after the Oprah effect brought Sauron's eyes gaze onto the book. And it was later discovered that large, large chunks of the book simply never happened. And that no one fact checked the book before publishing. Oh, uh, looking back, there's a fun tidbit. Bill Cosby was the person that showed up on the list the most with three books. Those are the meanest thing to say, the treasure hunt and the best way to play. You know, a lot of people think that the uh, the troubling at best books that people have heard of from the likes of uh, Mehmet or Dr. Oz, as people call him, uh, The Secret from Rhonda Byrne, uh, you know, those weren't actually on Oprah's book club. Uh, she had entire shows devoted to the book or author, but they were not actually on the, the, the club. So, hmm. um Though Oprah sure helped gain notoriety for those and many other woo and pseudoscience crap. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, she picked some, well, I'm sure one of her advisors uh, picked some pretty decent books in general, but uh, yeah. Alrighty then. Hmm. Well, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with science and technology. Woohoo! We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. 1,400 bones and 140 teeth from at least 15 hominid skeletons have been removed from a cave near Johannesburg, South Africa. Most early hominids have been poorly preserved, with a few fragments being all scientists have to go off of. This find was just the first haul, but there are thousands more remains in the cave. The shoulders and pelvis resemble Australopithecus, but the feet and some other features most closely resemble us, modern humans. Mm. 
The skull suggests the brain would be about half the size of ours, and the long fingers would have better enabled them to live in the trees. Uh, these bones are thought to belong to a previously undescribed species now being identified as Homo nadelli. Nailed it. Unfort Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, the age of these bones is not yet known. As more details are worked out, this new discovery has the chance to really define our own evolutionary family tree. Man, so they were found close to Johannesburg mm -hmm. in some really fucked up, deep, weird cave. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, this cave is bad enough that the first sign that anything was up was an ad posted for scientists or archaeologists who are very thin and not claustrophobic. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's looking like uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 meters back, but to back to this back chamber, but to get there, it's probably stretched out, you know, 150 meters and, you know, you got to crawl over a whole bunch of shit and go up mm -hmm. and down and all around. And Including a 12 meter vertical shaft <laughs> that looks tiny. Oh boy. Crazy. Yeah. I, I yeah. wonder why they went way back there. Shit. I wonder how they got out. That is one of the questions that they're going to have to try to figure out some answers to. Yeah. Maybe that was like a burial chamber. Of yeah. Sorts. Well, the, the fact that they were dragging them through a cave, the amount of fossil of, of bones being found there, the fossils, that's definitely a ritual, uh, ritualistic burial site. And that is, is fascinating for a, yeah, we don't know how old they are, but, a non-modern human species. Yeah, some of the close ones. Um, Neanderthals have been found to have ritualistic burials, Homo erectus. Uh, but for something that appears to be more primitive than Homo erectus to be doing ritualistic burial is pretty impressive. And also the cave might not have been that bad when they lived. Perhaps. All right. All right. And moving along. Mm. California's drought is pretty bad. Uh, it's re now resulted in mandatory water use restrictions or reductions issued by Governor Jerry Brown, a first, and the wildfires have caused a declaration of a state of emergency. So it's it's bad. Mm -hmm. To make this even more terrifying, the snowpack has now been calculated to be at its lowest level in 500 years, and they are also getting far less snowfall than normal. We're talking five percent as much as normal fuck this scenario is being caused by a mix of a severe drought and climate change causing warmer winter temperatures causing what little precipitation that does fall to fall as rain not snow and this is really bad since the snowpack is needed to store water until the spring and summer when it can melt and fill the reservoirs if the current conditions continue long term new reservoirs will need to be built to capture the rain runoff. Fortunately, a strong El Nino is anticipated for this winter, which could end the drought and restore the snowpack. Or it could cause a lot of rain and not much snow, which wouldn't help much. Or it could also just totally miss California. <laughs> but regardless of how this one turns out, we are already seeing the effects of climate change, and it sucks. For sure. And it's important to say that this drought isn't necessarily caused by climate change, but climate change has made it worse. The snowpack is a, a great example of that. The drought caused less precipitation. Climate change caused less of that to be snow. And the whole thing with climate change is it's not that it's going to be, you know, even if it never touches actual weather, it will cause everything to be more extreme. It's already causing everything to be more extreme. Uh, hurricanes are causing more flooding because sea levels are higher. Hurricanes are getting stronger because they're forming in warmer waters. This El Nino is going to be quite strong because the water is really hot in the Pacific right now. Droughts, when it's hotter, just a couple degrees hotter, are worse because more of the little bit of moisture that you do have gets evaporated off. It makes everything more extreme. I was just reading that this current El Nino is already raising some of the sea temperatures uh, more than two degrees Celsius, which is a hell of a change. 
Oh, yeah. But that's what an El Nino does. It's a, a collection of warm water in a spot in the eastern Pacific. But we've, we've talked about this El Nino recently. It's already caused crazy record hurricanes. It's all climate change in, in action. Yeah, well, so that means it's probably going to be a, a warmer than average winter for the Puget, uh, Puget Sound region, but uh, wet as fuck. That's what it sounded mm-hmm. like. Public Health England released a report last month declaring that vaping is 95% less harmful than smoking tobacco cigarettes. Hmm. This really should not be surprising, considering the fact that the most harmful components of cigarettes are the tar and smoke. It's also worth noting that this report is not saying that electronic cigarettes are completely safe. No one is claiming that. It's just saying that they are a valuable tool for harm reduction. And that is the key thing. It's all about harm reduction. This report was, of course, met with some criticism. The objections deal with the methodology used in coming up with the 95% number. And yeah, that methodology was crap. It was a (laughs) conference where some experts got together and kind of arbitrarily tried to figure out risk factors of the different ways of getting nicotine and giving them scores. And so they put cigarettes at 99.6% or 99.6 points bad. Cigarillos at 66.6%. Pipes at 22.2, I shouldn't say percent, points. 22.2 points. Cigars at 15.9 points. E-cigs at 3.4 points. Nasal sprays at 1.6. Oral products at 1.2. And the patch at 1.0. Wait, you can like snort nicotine up your nose? Yeah. Wow. That's uh, an approved... uh, Nicotine replacement therapy. Huh. I've never thought of that. There's objections with the methodology and some of the, a lot of the people involved in this conference had conflicts of interest. Some worked for tobacco harm reduction groups, um, like anti-smoking groups. Some worked for uh, electronic cigarette companies and those did not make it into the final report that Public Health England released. And some of the objections were even just that it sounds too good to be true. Now, personally, I would rather see researchers do high-quality research into the topic rather than criticize the quality or quantity of the research done to date. Uh, So long as they use current and quality equipment when they're doing it also. Yes, yes. And that they actually talk to people who are familiar with the products, like people who design or use them to make sure they're doing it right. Yeah. And then that the reporting is accurate for what the findings are, unlike that stupid one that keeps get keeps floating around uh, about the formaldehyde levels when it wasn't even looking at formaldehyde. It was chemicals that are similar to formaldehyde. And you're talking about the one with created, the really horribly outdated equipment that, yeah. that was improperly used. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, what it found was when you use it properly, it's pretty safe Hmm. and if you use it wrong it's really bad no shit (laughs) and as far as the too good to be true piece this i believe is because of how successful anti-smoking campaigns the last 30 years have been at making smoking and nicotine synonymous in people's minds yes some long-term health risks will probably be found but no one should be surprised that human ingenuity has managed to work out a satisfying way to consume nicotine that is less harmful than the deadly way it's been consumed for thousands of years. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we will be back with Politics and Religion. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine and Red Bull We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at AtheistNomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. We have a lot of news to work through, Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, most of them deal with church-state separation issues right here in the good old United States. Yeehaw! And so first off, we've got 
the Kim Davis update. So since our last news episode, um, she did have her, her contempt hearing. Yep. She was jailed. Yep. She was. Her employees all said that they would go ahead and, well, five of the four, or excuse me, five of the six said they would issue marriage licenses. The sixth was her son who said she, uh-huh. w- who said he wouldn't. Yep. Then they started talking about releasing her. And at least one of her employees said that he would disobey her orders and comply with the court. The other ones wouldn't really commit. And so she was released and told that she would go right back to jail if she interfered. The judge is not requiring her to actually issue the licenses herself, but she cannot interfere. Right. She doesn't even have to sign them now. She has edited the form to say by court order <laughs> instead of her name. Okay, that's fine. I have a, a marriage certificate with the the Ada County clerk's signature on it. I don't care about his signature. That's not significant to me. <laughs> <laughs> the seal that is stamped on it that says that it's official, yeah, that part is, but not his signature and his name on it. I don't care about that. Fuck him. <laughs> Fuck her. Mm. Uh, so, but this is, has brought up so much crazy news and so much keeps happening. Uh, there will be very few links relative to what we're talking about that are actually going to be in the show notes. You know, the, the one guy that said he would continue to issue ma- marriage licenses to, to same sex couples was a guy named deputy clerk, Brian Mason. And yeah, uh, even if Kim Davis, Davis tells him not to, when she returns, he's going to keep on issuing uh, li- licenses to sec- same sex mm-hmm. couples, which is, I don't know anything else about the guy, but you know what? Good on you for that, man. We're recording this on Tuesday, September 15th. Yep. Uh, she went back to work for us yesterday mm. and a lesbian couple got their license from that clerk today. Cool. And she did not interfere. There have been so many people coming out of the woodworks. When she was released, Mike Huckabee was holding a rally (laughs) outside of the detention center she was at. Playing Eye of the Tiger, no less. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Which the band wasn't too happy about. And Huckabee was actually able to then go in and escort her out of the building. (laughs) Right to a rally in her honor. The Oath Keepers group wanted to send people to protect her from being re-imprisoned. And her lawyers, the... Fucking Liberty Council. (laughs) Yeah, they actually told Oath Keepers to not intervene. That is like the the most sane thing they've said in a very long time. For that Oath Keepers to stand down. Yeah. And I'm honestly surprised they listened. Uh huh. <laughs> because and, and Kim- oath keepers, you know, the, most of them are like prior military or or prior like serving police. Some are still currently, and you know what? All of those motherfuckers took an oath to uphold the Constitution, and mm-hmm. you know all the the rules and laws put in place. And you know what? The the uh, Kim Kim is a fucking rule breaker. Yeah, yeah, and they want to defend her. All right, fuck you guys. Yeah. Plus, you guys are fucking creepy and weird anyways. Well, it shouldn't be surprising. They went to Ferguson to protect business owners from the thugs that were rioting. Oh, don't forget. uh, Oh, no. Clive and Bundy. Oh, Clive and Bundy. There you go. Yeah. There was a a mining dispute outside of Grants Pass, my hometown. Mm-hmm. They went out there just in case the BLM said, oh, nope, you didn't do the paperwork right. You have to get out. (laughs) The paperwork being the correct filing after the sale of the claim. Because they've got this mindset that public property is personal property if you decide you want to use it. And that public officials don't have to do their job if their private beliefs say no. Oh, come on. They're, they're totally Christian. They're, they're, they are seriously like a, a Christian terrorist organization to me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. And so 
Anyways, has also gotten some really interesting comments from a few presidential candidates. And we're going to start off with the man who right now is polling in second place in the Republican Party, famed neurosurgeon Ben Carson, who was a brilliant neurosurgeon, but is an idiot of a person. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> But the detractors say that that's a slippery slope because now next thing you're going to have Catholics who refuse to issue a marriage license to people who have been divorced or Muslims who refuse to issue a marriage license to people who want to be Muslims who want to marry Christians and so on. Where does it end? But but this is a very basic right. You know, uh, this is a Judeo-Christian nation in the sense that a lot of our values and principles are based on our Judeo-Christian faith. And when, when there are substantial numbers of people who actually believe in the traditional definition of marriage, uh, I'm one of them. doesn't mean that I don't think other people can do whatever they want to do, but I don't actually believe that they have the right to force their way of life upon everybody else, nor would I try to force my way of life upon everybody else. And this is where some intellect has to come into place. And, you know, our legislators need to sit down and ask themselves, how do we make sure that the rights of all Americans are protected? Mm -hmm. This requires a little bit of effort. How to make sure there are all the people's rights are protected. Well, how about starting with giving equal rights to everybody? Uh-huh. And he said that, you know, you shouldn't be able to force your beliefs on everyone else. Exactly. That's exactly what Kim Davis has been trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and before we get to Mike Huckabee, I, I do want to say one interesting thing she's done is uh, she's been petitioning the state legislature to take, and a couple other uh, objecting um, county clerks have been uh, petitioning the legislature to take marriage licenses away from them. And give them to who? <laughs> Another unelected uh, state bureaucratic agency. Okay. Which, considering that's a large portion of what clerks do, yeah. and the filing fees are a very large portion of their budget, they'd have a hard time justifying being there without marriage licenses. Well, you know, and you know, do like a in and out thing with like the DMV. You know, get your tabs, get your license. Zzz. This is also uh, bringing up that there are jobs, elected positions in Kentucky that don't really need to be elected. <laughs> like another one they've got is county jailers, hmm. including in counties that don't have a jail. <laughs> But it's a county office that they're required to elect and pay. Nice. And so this could result in the elimination of elected county clerks in that state, possibly even the elimination of their offices. You could just let regular court clerks handle it. There's a lot of people you could let handle it. And you know, yeah, they're not going to like how this ends up turning out. I am totally fine with, you know, having... The, their positions like Kim's here not be elected. You know, they should hire and fire them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why this needs to be an elected position. I, I'm a firm believer that deliberative bodies and executives should be elected and professional staff should be hired. Yeah, and fired. Like, like elected coroners? That's, that's kind of weird and kind of creepy. Seriously? Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Mike Huckabee was on Morning Joe on MSNBC. Oh, yeah. He's the winner. And I, I only have a few of the times that he didn't answer the question in this clip. And I had to trim it way down because <laughs> they spent 15 minutes trying to get him to answer one question. Oh, yeah. That's where he's dodging all the time, isn't it? That was yep. great. <laughs> what if Kim Davis wanted to get a third or a fourth marriage license from somebody who truly believes that you should only get married once? What would you, you know, say Kim to Davis that? Kim Davis is, well, she's actually been married four times. That's my uh, point. 
Yeah, and, and here's the thing, Mika, maybe you, what you don't know is that she has been married four times. She's a person who says, I lived a, a very different life. I lived a life of sin. And four years ago, Kim Davis came to Christ. She and there's a lot more condemnation for people like myself who have been divorced than there is condemnation for people that participate in the gay lifestyle. Well, l let me challenge the idea that he never spoke about uh, marriage because he did. No, First no, no, of all, no, no, not marriage. homosexual. No, not, not marriage. Well, I know, he but spoke a Joe, lot about marriage. marriage homosexual marriage was not an issue in the first century. There was no push for same-sex marriage when Jesus was teaching, but right. what he did say was that a man shall leave his father and mother and a woman shall leave. And, and so I think what would it's you think if a judge in Arkansas said, I'm not going to divorce these people because Jesus Christ said that divorce is, is an abomination and it is adultery. You know, a judge in Chattanooga, in fact, dismissed a divorce case before him because of the Supreme Court case. He said if the Supreme Court doesn't think that the people of Tennessee are smart enough to define when marriage begins and what it is, then obviously the Supreme Court doesn't think they're smart enough to okay. determine when one should end. I don't want to hear about and that, And so he's judge. dismissed it. Mike Huckabee, I Why want not? to hear... Because uh, that's be important. Because, Mike Huckabee, I asked you a question. Would you support a clerk who would not give Kim Davis a third or a fourth marriage license? You. I, I'm not sure if I follow that question, Nika, because... If a clerk because... says, I'm sorry, I don't think you should get married more than once or twice, and you're asking for your third or your fourth license, You're asking and a I don't question of a different nature. Giving... That's no, a different nature, Mika. No, yes, I'm not. I'm asking, because would you support there, that there's clerk? There's a difference... There's a difference between a marriage between a man and a woman and a marriage between two men or a marriage between two women. So you women. would support We're not talking, the clerk. No, you, let me answer your question. I'd love it. You, okay. What we're talking about is whether or not we can redefine marriage, not whether or not that a person can have more than one because the law clearly says what people can do. They can have a divorce. We have laws for that. I think we the have law laws says for you marriage can get married and remarriage. now as a gay person. So if you're well, following what law is that, the Mika? Law, can you can you quote me the statute? Can you quote me? The now, he eventually does ramble his way to where he thinks the difference actually lies. And that is because divorce is established in state laws, whereas same sex marriage, with a few exceptions, was done by the Supreme Court. And what's disappointing is the, the host of, of Morning Joe, they weren't able to say it was guaranteed by the 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection. That's the law. Yeah, and all this has been going on while a Muslim flight attendant <sighs> has been suspended from her job because her faith won't allow her to serve alcohol. Right. She's a recent convert anyways. but uh, Uh-huh. You know she what? wasn't a Muslim when she became a flight attendant. Right. And even after she became Muslim and she brought this to her boss's attention, uh, they had a hell of a compromise. So long as everybody agreed that, you know, the other attendants on the plane would do her job for her serving alcohol, then, you know, good to go. No problems. But somebody stood up and said, you know what? No, nah, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to do your job for you, too. And now, where that compromise could bite the airline in the ass is it created a situation with unclear policy. When she first objected, if they'd said, I'm sorry, that is a critical part of your job duties. If you won't do that, you can't work here. They would have been better protected than saying, okay, we'll try to work with you. Oh, sorry, this accommodation isn't working. They, they've set themselves up for potential lawsuit loss. Mm -hmm. I, I hope they don't lose, but that could bite them in the ass. But to put this in perspective, most of the in-flight sales on flights are alcohol. Sure. Now, for me. of course, some of that's because the soft drinks are provided free. Yeah, mixer. But this would be kind of like a restaurant where somebody refuses to serve alcohol or a convenience store where somebody refuses to sell beer or cigarettes. Or bacon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the convenience store is really the best, uh, would be the best comparison because almost all of the money they make is from alcohol and tobacco sales. The other products is pennies. Just and if, vehicles to sell their cigarettes and tobacco yeah. and alcohols. Yeah. Yep. <laughs>
Ah, all right. So we do have uh, other news. And oh, this first one's a doozy. <laughs> KRQE of Albuquerque, New Mexico has investigated a pretty bizarre crossing of the line between church and state. Holly Salzman went to the family court division of the local district court for help with co-parenting between her and her ex-husband of their twin 11-year-old sons. The court ordered her to attend 10 counseling sessions with Mary Pepper, mm. a self-described educator, mentor, and teacher for couples. And she then opened each session with prayer and included religious discussions, pamphlets, and homework. Salzman, eh, religious pamphlets and religious homework. Salzman complained to Pepper about the religious materials being included in a court-ordered counseling session. She then complained to the court, who said they hadn't heard any complaints before, <laughs> and so dismissed it. When she then stopped attending, her sons were taken from her, so she begrudgingly completed the remainder of the sessions. And for the final three, she had KRQE recording undercover video and audio, and they found several references to religion. Hmm. And some of this was not very subtle. Uh, like, Salzman told her in one of the meetings, or excuse me, Pepper told Salzman in one of the meetings, the meaning in my life is to know, love, and serve God. If you want to explore how God was in your past, how God was in your life and not in your life, I know you don't believe in God, which is fine, but I know at some points he was in your life in some way. Sounds dirty. Yeah. Forcing religious materials on an atheist under court order mm, mm, mm. and taking her kids when she didn't, wouldn't put up with it. Mm. Uh, Pepper told the station when they, they talk, tried to talk to her that she has a secular track that most clients get, but those who express an interest in religion get a religious track. <laughs> she also claimed that Salzman expressed an interest in spirituality despite the fact that she made it clear she didn't believe in God. And so if objections to religion are counted as an interest in it, then I wonder how people actually get into the secular track. <laughs> oh, and it actually gets weirder from there. Pepper meets with her clients, half of which are court ordered, in public libraries. Weird. And city policy forbids the sale of products or services on library property. And so she takes payment secretly, literally under the table. It's fucking weird. <laughs> and this is court ordered. And the other thing that's disturbing, she self identifies as an educator, mentor, and teacher. Sure. <laughs> She's not a social worker, not a licensed counselor, not a psychologist. She has no letters after her name. Is that what you're saying? No letters. Yeah. All right. How in the fuck is a judge recommending people, well, telling people to go see this woman? And this is in Albuquerque. It's not so, some small town. Mm, There's actual licensed therapists that could be doing this. I'm sure at least Who would one. actually have some kind of ethical standards that they would operate under. And an office that w they would always make their patients go to. Yeah. What? An office where you'd have actual privacy as opposed to a Bible study at the library. <laughs> yeah, under the table, fucking passing money and shit. What? That's just weird, man. Just weird. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Man, yeah. And they have had the ACLU look into this, and they definitely think this doesn't seem right. <laughs> well, I'm really glad that uh, KRQE News 13 is getting involved in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, oh, nice. We're just going to be bumping a state over huh. here for the next few. Well, there you go. Uh, so, bumping one state to the east, mm -hmm. Robert Lloyd applied for a job to be a constable in Williamson County, Texas in 2013. And the, que and the commissioners asked him questions about his views on gay marriage, religion, and abortion during the interview. Like you do. Okay. <laughs> to be a constable. Sure. A cop. Sure. Because that's totally important for a cop. Yeah. Uh, Lloyd's lawyer says that the commissioners, who were all Baptists, were wanting to hire a fellow Baptist. And as a 25-year law enforcement veteran, 
Lloyd was shocked by these questions, and so he has filed a lawsuit in federal court that will soon be going to trial. Sweet. And two other people have said that they were asked the same questions when applying for jobs with the county. Well, you know, it's important to be a Bible thumper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it, in, a dip, in a deposition, Commissioner Lisa Berkman actually admitted to asking these questions. Sure, why not? <laughs> it's <laughs> as if they haven't heard the only reference to religion in the original text of the Constitution. There shall be no religious test for public office. And they're applying very literally a religious test in the interview. Yeah. And moving north to Oklahoma, Oklahoma County District Judge Thomas Prince has given state officials until October 12 to comply with the state Supreme Court's June 30 order to remove the six-foot-tall Ten Commandments monument at the state capitol building. Wahoo! <laughs> at the same time, he has also rejected a motion from the state attorney general's office claiming that the order to remove the monument was, and get this, unconstitutionally hostile towards religion. Right. This is despite the fact that this is the exact opposite of their argument that they had for the higher court, which was that the monument wasn't religious. I'm just really glad that they haven't tried to sell the, the like 40 square foot that this thing is sitting <laughs> on to some private group. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. It'll be really interesting to see if they actually comply. I actually doubt they will, because at this point, they're trying to work some kind of a legislative workaround. They're actually going to try to amend the state constitution no, to not. get around this. <laughs> and that's a slow process. So they have until October 12. Well, they ain't going to do shit be between now and then. After that date, they will be in contempt of court. <laughs> and we've seen what happens when you're in contempt of court. Well, at least in Kentucky. <laughs> God, I want her to just fuck it up and go back to jail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Ah, the waiting game. All right. Yep. All right. And moving on to at least, you know, get one international story in here. Four atheist bloggers in Bangladesh have been murdered this year, mm. and there is a hit list with 84 bloggers on it that was published online. It should not be surprising that at least 12 bloggers have fled the country. Fucking A. Run! Forrest, run! Yeah. I'm also glad that the article didn't say where they went to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, fortunately, three suspects from the past killings have been taken into custody, and... Hassanul Haq Inu, the information minister, said that the investigations are continuing and that one trial has started. Unfortunately, he also suggested that they may be cracking down on bloggers who defame religion, which could mean 10 years in prison for hurting religious feelings. Yeah, how about killing motherfuckers? You know what? That deserves prison time, too. Yep. Man, stay safe. Get the fuck out of that country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these bloggers have, have claimed that there's 100,000 atheists in Bangladesh. I, I My understanding is that there is easy border crossing between Bangladesh and India. India might not be the most tolerant country, but a hell of a lot better than Bangladesh. And they probably won't kill you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <sighs> and to uh, finish up the news on a humorous note... John Oliver's Our Lady of the Perpetual Exemption Church has closed. Aww. They continued receiving seed donations, both the kind they wanted, money, and literal seeds, and have amazingly still managed to not break any laws. But, in Oliver's words, we're closing because multiple people sent a sperm through the mail. And when someone sends you jizz through the mail, it's time to stop whatever you're doing. So we're shutting the shit down. Praise be. He also included a note that the money is all being sent on to Doctors Without Borders. They, however, did not forward the sperm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, I love you, John Oliver. <laughs> you know what? He might be the, the most listened to voice out there now since, since John Stewart left. 
Yeah. And you know, damn, one of the most badass. Huh? And one of the most badass. Oh yeah. Sexy. Snappy dresser. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It is <laughs> time for feedback. Hmm. Regarding episode 110 from Fred H, that's at Miami Fred, at Atheist Nomads, FYI, it's city of South Miami, not Miami Beach, wanting to secede from the state. No biggie, but I thought I'd mention it. Sorry, my bad. It's just down there south somewhere, I I don't know. I got the wrong, not quite Miami. I'll let you take these two. Pat Miller via Facebook. Guys, Lenny... Reifenstahl was a woman. And uh, also from Charles Ward, uh, Lenny Reifenstahl. You nailed the first name, but the last name is Reifenstahl. First syllable is re. All right. Oh, and he is a she. Grins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, also, alcoholic root beer uh, from Charles also. There are a couple of beautiful entries in this category, in addition to the one you mentioned. There's also another lovely entry from a uh, mission called hard root beer. Not quite as se- sweet, but also nice. Keep up the great work. Yeah. I'll have to you know keep my eyes open for any more to see if, you know, they're even how many are actually even available here. Hmm. Then regarding episode 111 from Jamila Randall via the website. Excellent episode. I just shared it on Facebook. This is something my husband struggles with as a black atheist. I have found that in the Indian community, there is a wealth of diversity from atheists to Muslims to Hindus to Christians to Buddhists, so I've never had trouble finding a tribe to relate to. Indians seem familiar with others. Hmm. The black community can be very unwelcoming of atheists. It's very sad. Thanks for sharing this topic. You are very welcome. And uh, Jamila, glad you uh, you listened. Yay. Yeah, because Alex was really awesome. Yeah. Oh, man. We got to have him on again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then just some general feedback from Jason Ford via email. You folks will love this. It's a medical podcast focused on Canada. They do excellent research and bring on experts all the time, all of which are really interesting characters. This episode is about e-cigarettes. I've posted the link below. Hmm. P.S. Though Canadian focused, you folks would enjoy it and should listen to all of their episodes. Well, medical issues affect the States as much as Canada. And I did listen to it. Uh, It was much more balanced coverage of the topic than I have generally seen in mainstream media. So that was quite refreshing. However, the basic feel of it was like the Canadian version of NPR. Anyway, you can all email us at contact at atheistnomads.com or you can call us at 541-203-0666 or hit us up on Twitter at Atheist Nomads or on Facebook. And we have new patrons. Holy shit. First one's an upgrade. Q-Man to Platinum. And he sent us a note. Hey, Dustin and Wesley, your show is awesome, and I never miss an episode. This morning, I decided to change my Patreon pledge from $1 per month to $10 per month. Thanks for putting together an awesome show every week. Keep up the great work, Hugh Man. I have a feeling that's not his real name, but yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Jaded Zappa came on board as a new gold sponsor. Sweet. And Sean Grant came on as a new bronze sponsor. Duck a duck. He also sent a note along with it. I can't imagine the work that goes into a weekly podcast with full-time jobs. I'd like to stop you there. Not as much as you think, but we appreciate it. (laughs) 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 Continuing. (laughs) I love the interesting guests that are interviewed. Dustin, Wesley, and now Lauren ask great questions that help listeners get to know them better. I'm a former SDA, so I really love the new segment on putting your degree to work. I can relate to many of the wacky theology as I was taught it myself. I never experienced survival training. Never knew the SDA church did it. Must be new as I've been out of the church for 20 years. I did have nightmares fleeing into the wilderness with the evil Sunday laws. What fuckery we went through. Mm. By the way, do SDAs have pepper on their tables now? They didn't when I was growing up, but you know why. LOL. Again, great show, and I hope my small contribution can help. Wish it was more, but I have student loans as well. And to explain some of that and also respond to it uh, for people without the Adventist background. Yeah. uh, Senior survival, I thought it was just a general thing. It may just be a Northwest thing. I know the other schools, when I was in in high school and college, were were doing it it, within the Northwest. 
And my mom in the 60s in Idaho went through senior survival. So that's not new, but it might just be Northwest. And it's a little bit easier to practice fleeing in the wilderness when you have wilderness nearby. My high school, we literally went five miles away. <laughs> we were already in the wilderness. Well, if you're in the burbs or, you know, small town, you don't have to go very far. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> Man. And so the uh, pepper on the tables, Ellen White uh, really discouraged people from eating any spicy food, using any spices. Um, didn't want anything if you heat it up and excite the senses and make you lustful. Sure. John Harvey Kellogg was also anti-spice and flavor for fear that it would excite the senses and make you lustful. And that's how you got that bland ass, you know, Kellogg, uh, Kellogg's uh, cornflakes. Yep. Yeah. Which his version was actually more bland than that. Ew. His brother added sugar to make it something he could sell. <laughs> and that's how and you got so anyways, the, flakes. The uh, pepper on the tables, I think my church growing up might have, but it was also a pretty liberal church in the Northwest and we were renting the building from a Baptist church. Really nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't think the Baptists would share like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they were willing to take a thousand dollars a month. Oh, okay, okay, fair or enough. Fourteen, fifteen hundred a month, something like that. Huh. Yeah. All right, we have gone really long. This is going to be fun trimming this down to a uh, usable size. So let's call it a night. Yeah, fucking night. Have All a good right. night, y'all. We will be back at you next week with an interview. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomad.